Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I am Masood Raja, and I am here today to offer yet another episode in my series on Orientalism. Now, we are still on Chapter 1, and in the previous lecture, I had covered up to page 43, and today we will be reading and talking from top of page 43 to top of page 46. Now, the discussion preceding it involved Saeed explaining how Orientalism has existed in different forms. And the one that I explained at the end of the last video was what it inherits from the pre-19th and 18th century knowledge about the East and knowledge about the Orient and then reworks it. And in today's section, Saeed will give us about two or three more manifestations of Orientalism. And what, what is coming across really clearly is that he is establishing the discursive existence of Orientalism. So if you watch the earlier lectures in this series, you probably already are aware that Orientalism for Said is a kind of discourse, right, which has its experts, institutions, a body of knowledge, modes of dissemination. And this knowledge coupled with power is what constitutes the Orientalist discourse, right, and its practical manifestations. So we'll move on to read and talk about what he covers uh, from page 43 to 46. So here we go. I will offer you the first set of reading and then I can come back and talk to you about it. With such experiences as Napoleon's, the Orient as a body of knowledge in the West was modernized. And this is a second form in which 19th and 20th century Orientalism existed. From the outside set of the period I shall be examining, there was everywhere amongst Orientalists the ambition to formulate their discoveries, experiences, and insights suitably in modern terms to put ideas about the Orient in very close touch with modern realities. Renan's linguistic investigations of Semitic in 1848, for example, were couched in a style that drew heavily for its authority upon contemporary comparative grammar, comparative anatomy, and racial theory. These lent his Orientalism prestige and, the other side of the coin, made Orientalism vulnerable, as it has been ever since, to modish as well as seriously influential currents of thought in the West. Orientalism has been subjected to imperialism, positivism, utopianism, historicism, Darwinism, racism, Freudianism, Marxism, Spenglerism, but Orientalism, like many of the natural and social sciences, has had paradigms of research, its own learned societies, its own establishment. During the 19th century, the field increased enormously in prestige, as did also the reputation and influence of such institutions as the Society Asiatique, the Royal Asiatic Society, the Dovish Morgenländisch, it's German, and the American Oriental Society. With the growth of these societies went also an in with the growth of these societies went also an increase all across Europe in the number of professorships in Oriental studies. Consequently, there was an expansion in the available means for disseminating Orientalism. Orientalist periodicals beginning with the with the Fundragon de Orientis. 1809 multiplied the quantity of knowledge as well as the number of specialties. So as you can see in this section, Said is trying to establish Orientalism and its growth as a discourse, as a body of knowledge, but also as a field and discipline. So if you look at the vocabulary of these passages, so first stage or first form of Orientalism was the pre-19th century, which was brought into the present, post-19th century, post-Napoleonic invasion. But what he then says is that the practitioners modernize it. What does it mean? Well, modernization of Orientalism means is that it is 
defined and articulated within the disciplinary boundaries of whatever scientific research was available then, right? So it is made scientific. The vocabulary is changed. The scholars start using contemporary methods of analysis, all applying to the Orient. So there is a certain degree of scientificity involved here, right? And that's why he's talking about all those isms, right, that permeate the discussion of the Orient, right? Spanglerism, uh, for example, comes from the German uh, philosopher Edward Spangler, right? Oswald Spangler, right, uh, who in his book, The Decline of the West, right, uh, claimed that civilizations go up and downs just like the biological entities, right? biological organisms. So whenever the new knowledges are produced and their taxonomies and systems are created, the same rules are applied to the Orientalist discourse or, or the discipline or field of Orientalist studies. And as what Said is also saying is that this trend continues, that what he's hinting at is that contemporary Orientalism, therefore, is also informed by the theories and methodologies developed in present times and of course is permeated also through with the politics of the time. And then further, what else develops which is Orientalist is the, the discussion societies, the organizations that call themselves the Orientalist organizations, right? And with the sole purpose of sending expeditions there, writing about the Orient, right? disseminating works about the Orient. So there is no accident, right? There are actual organizations with members working on the Orient as object of study and then the research journals. So if you think about it, every field of study that claims to be a field of study has to have these things. It has to have practitioners. It has to have a body of knowledge that it must study, an object of study, which in this case is the Orient and the Orientalists. And it must have a methodology or a combination of methodologies, which Said is pointing out has started developing in the 19th century and, and beyond. And then it has its professional organizations, its professional journals. So the second form that he's talking about in which Orientalism existed was in this disciplinary form where it modernizes and modifies the pre-19th century knowledges about the Orient codifies it, right, and develops new trends and new paradigms in it. That reference in paradigm is, of course, a reference to Thomas Kuhn's famous um, book on the paradigmatic nature of knowledge, how knowledge shifts or knowledge production shifts when a new paradigm emerges. So he's referring to that. So that is explana his explanation of this entire mechanism of journals societies, authors, disciplinary knowledges and methodologies that are now coming together to shape Orientalism post 19th century and all of it is convincing enough to tell us, to teach us that Orientalism of course is a discourse. It has a body of knowledge and power, right, and an object of study upon which it is applied, right? So that's what comes across to me in reading the passage that I just read to you. Let's go on and read some more and then we'll talk about it. Yet little of this activity and very few of these institutions existed and flourished freely. For in a third form in which it existed, Orientalism imposed li limits upon thought about the Orient. Even the most imaginative writers of an age, men like Flaubert, Nerval, or Scott, were constrained in what they could either experience of or say about the Orient. For Orientalism was ultimately a political vision of reality whose structure promoted the difference between the familiar, Europe, the West, us, and the strange, the Orient, the East, them. This vision, in a sense, created and then served the two worlds thus conceived. Orientals lived in their world. We lived in ours. The vision and material reality propped each other up, kept each other going. 
A certain freedom of intercourse was always the Westerner's privilege because his was the stronger culture he could penetrate, he could wrestle with, he could give shape and meaning to the great Asiatic mystery, as Disraeli once called it. Yet what has, I think, been previously overlooked is the constricted vocabulary of such a privilege and the comparative limitations of such a vision. My argument takes it that the Orientalist reality is both anti-human and persistent, its scope as, as much as its institutions and all pervasive influence lost up to the present. So these are also some deeply instructive passages. So he has told us the two previous forms in which Orientalism existed, the pre-19th century, the scientific and modernization of it, with an ability to produce knowledge, right? But then he is now telling us that in the third form, this body of knowledge that is produced, the disciplinary boundaries that ensue, also control the way people, no matter how learned and how transcultural, view the Orient, because they have already internalized systematically that there is us, Europe, and there is this Orient that we study. We study it as others have studied it, so that already predisposes them into the dominant studying group and orient into the object of study. There is a word that Said uses in the last few lines of this passage, and that is the anti-humanist nature of Orientalism. What does it mean? Of course, not that it goes out killing humans. That anti-humanism is whenever you argue that it's not the central subject who is determining his or her actions, but those actions are over-determined by the larger discourses that determine the subject, right? So the anti-humanism of Orientalism is that even though the colonial writers, the European writers do use a limited form of their individual agency in researching about the Orient or talking about it, so much of it is over-determined by their view of themselves as the West and Orient as the East and then the mysteries of the Orient and everything else. So in so many ways that over-determines what will they study, how will they study it, and how will they think about the Orient. And what they have also internalized is the logic that they, being the Europeans, are the superior form of species or humans or cultures, and what they are studying is inferior in terms of culture. May, it might be mysterious, it might be magical, but it is not West. It is, in a way, the West's other. And this tendency to read the Orient and other cultures, what Said is saying is, it continues and it even exists in the present as he's writing the book. And we know from the contemporary politics and cultural production that in so many ways, this dichotomy still works when it comes to the relationships between the West and rest of the world or the Islamic world. So that is the third form in which Orientalism exists, right? In a form where it is disciplinarily so strong, the societies and everything else, they don't just exist in isolation, they also in a way over-determine the way those who call themselves Orientalists interact with the Orient, write about it, research about it. Let's read some more and talk about it. But how did and does Orientalism work? How can one describe it all together as a historical phenomena, a way of thought, a contemporary problem, and a material reality? Consider Cromer, again, an accomplished technician of empire, but also a beneficiary of Orientalism. He can furnish us with a rudimentary answer. In the government of subject races, he wrestles with the problem of how Britain, a nation of individuals, is to administer a wide-flung empire according to a number of central principles. He contrasts the local agent, who has both a specialist knowledge of the native and Anglo-Saxon indiv individuality, with the central authority at home in London. The former may treat subjects of local interest in a manner calculated to damage or even to jeopardize imperial interests. The central authority is in, an, in a position to obviate any danger 
arising from this cause. Why? Because this authority can ensure the harmonious working of the different parts of the machine and should endeavor so far as possible to realize the circumstances attendant on the government of the dependency. The language is vague and unattractive, but the point is not hard to grasp. Cromer envisions a seat of power in the West and radiating out from it towards the East a great embracing machine, sustaining the central authority yet commanded by it. But the machine's branches feed into it in the East, human material, material wealth, knowledge, what have you, is processed by the machine, then converted into more power. The specialist does the immediate translation of mere oriental matter into useful substance. The oriental becomes, for example, a subject race, an example of an oriental mentality, all for the enhancement of the authority at home. Local interests are orientalist special interests. The central authority is the general interest of the imperial society as a whole. What Cromer quite accurately sees is the management of knowledge by society. The fact that knowledge, no matter how special, is regulated first by the local concerns of a specialist, later by the general concerns of a social system of authority. The interplay between local and central interests is intricate but by no means indiscriminate. So here we get a mechanistic explanation of the system of knowledge itself, right? On one end of it is the Orient and the Orientalist specialist. On the other end of the it is the central authority, which is the seat of the empire. And if you think of this machine, what Said is talking about is that the center is from where policy emanates, right? Knowledge radiates outwards towards the far-flung regions of the center. And there is a conversation between the specialist on the ground, the orientalist on the ground, and the central authority. Now remember, he's referring to Cromer, whom we discussed earlier in one of the videos, where Cromer is basically saying that if the central interest in Egypt is weakened, what it would end up doing is weakening the aura of the local office officials who depend on the support of the center to present a certain magisterial aura to the natives, right? So what that mechanistic logic then explains to us is that the function of the orientalist is to take the raw materials, the subject races, the literal raw materials, and transform them into usable commodities which are passed on to the center, right? And it is the center that decides the dispensation of that knowledge and the distance dispensation of power. So the way the center holds it, its authority is by actually legitimizing or kind of circulating whatever is passed on to it back to the colonies, back to the Orientals. But there is this correspondence between the Orientalist or the specialist on ground who collects raw materials, may it be knowledge, may it be actual raw materials, shapes them, defines them, researches upon them and then passes that knowledge on to the center who further disseminates it. And But what he's saying is that this is not random. Remember, he's using the analogy of a well-coordinated, well-oiled machine. So this is where he's mechanistically trying to explain this relationship between the Orientalist and Specialist in the field and the seat of the empire itself, the center, right? And in the process, how is the figure of the Oriental constructed, disseminated, passed on, and consumed? He will then go on in the next paragraphs that I will read into a more organismic explanation, you know, by referring to the chain of being, right? So in a way, then, he is relying here both, 
let's say, the Hobbesian mechanistic model of explaining a system, but also the vitalist or uh, organismic model of explaining the politics, right, where, where you imagine a system as, a, as an organism. So that will come across in the next paragraphs. But just keep in mind how he is explaining the role of the specialists, right, in transforming the raw materials of knowledge and the actual raw materials and passing them on to the center, to the seat of power, and then that power radiating it all across, in a way, circulating it back. In Cromer's own case as an imperial administrator, the proper study is also man. He says, when Pope proclaimed the proper study of mankind to be man, he meant all men, including the poor Indian, whereas Cromer's also reminds us that certain men, such as Orientals, can be singled out as the subject for proper study. The proper study in this sense of Orientals is Orientalism, properly separate from other forms of knowledge, but finally useful, because finite, for the material and social reality enclosing all knowledge at any time, supporting knowledge, providing it with uses. An order of sovereignty is set up from east to west, a mock chain of being whose clearest form was given once by Kipling. Mule, horse, elephant, or bullock, he obeys his driver, and the driver his sergeant, and the sergeant his lieutenant, and the lieutenant his captain, and the captain his major, and the major his colonel, and the colonel his brigadier commanding three regiments, and the brigadier his general who obeys the viceroy who is the servant of the Empress, end of quote. As deeply forged as is this monstrous chain of command, as strongly managed as is Cromer's harmonious working, Orientalism can also express the strength of the West and the Orient's weakness, as seen by the West. Such strength and such weakness are as in, in intrinsic to Orientalism as they are to any view that divides the world into large general divisions, entities that coexist in a state of tension produced by what is believed to be radical difference. So the reference to Pope here is, of course, Alexander Pope, uh, not the Pope Pope, and his es poem, An Essay on Man, in which he declares that the right study for mankind is man himself. And then he goes to Cromer, Said goes to Cromer's writing, where he basically believes in this idea that the, 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 the one major form of study is to study humans themselves, but within that, then, the Oriental becomes a separate category of human, right, who needs to be managed, who needs to be studied, who needs to be controlled. And the reference to Kipling is to this pseudo chain, right, the chain of being, which is, you know, in reference to the great chain of being, the medieval idea, or even before that, Plato and Aristotle, this hierarchical chain of being at the top of which is God, and then angels, and then humans, and then the lower forms, what they would call animals and inanimate things. That's the great chain of being that was operative in medieval thought. That's how people thought of the society. And so, Kipling's explanation on a horizontal plane in a chain of command is from the foot soldier and the animals all the way up to the empress is the chain of command. Now within that then the way Cromer or any other orientalist will think in a way what Said is suggesting is that they would place the orientals at their assigned spot right in that chain of command. And then that is when they become objects of study or considered subject races, right? And in that research is also written this preconceived idea that the West is stronger, has the power to study these people, to govern these people, right? That is the Cromer mindset. And that study, what Said is saying is, or that inclination to study the subject races, is part of Orientalism. And it is maintained 
that mindset, that ideology and that system is maintained with this idea of a world in which these two entities, the West and the Orient, can coexist, but with a radical difference, right? Radical difference being the difference that cannot be reconciled. Right? It is the kind of radical alterity, this other, that must be studied, must be recorded, must be controlled, and must be made obedient to the power of the West. And this entire process is part of the Orientalist project. Right, That's what we gather from these passages. So let's go and read a little more and then come and talk about it intellectual issue raised by Orientalism. Can one divide human reality, as indeed human reality seems to be genuinely divided into clearly different cultures, histories, traditions, societies, even races, and survive the consequences humanly? By surviving the consequences humanly, I mean to ask whether there is any way of avoiding the hostility expressed by the division say, of men into us Westerners and they Orientals. For such divisions are generalities whose use historically and actually has been to press the importance of the distinction between some men and some other men, usually towards not especially admirable ends. When one uses categories like Oriental and Western as both the starting and the end points of analysis, research, public policy, as the categories were used by Balfour and Cromer, the result is usually to polarize the distinction. The Oriental becomes more Oriental, the Western more Western, and limit the human encounter between different cultures, traditions, and societies. In short, from its earliest modern history to the present, Orientalism as a form of thought for dealing with the foreign has typically shown the altogether regrettable tendency of any knowledge based on such hard and fast distinctions as East and West. To channel thought into a West or an East compartment, because this tendency is right at the center of Orientalist theory, practice, and values found in the West, the sense of Western power over the Orient is taken for granted as having the status of scientific truth. So this is where, in my opinion, Said is going to the very binaristic structure of the Orientalist thought. So in the previous passages that I talked about before I read the ones that you just watched, he talks about radical difference. And the questions that he poses in these passages that I just read, the question that he's posing is that if you already have divided the world into this binaristic structure of West and East, and build a body of knowledge and a methodology of studying this division, then you are already establishing the division and enhancing it. Because if you take up the position of the West as us and East as them, then you're already studying the them in this binaristic structure, which will then force you to think of them as these others and maybe as inferiors, right? And that is what ends up happening in the discourse of Orientalism. This other is created, then this other is stabilized, then the experts produce research about it, write cultural critiques about it, write issues of race, and then associate essentialist traits to that race. And what comes out of it then is an intact radicality difference, right, in which there the us part of it is privileged, right, in that binary structure and strengthened. And also the same body of knowledge then creates this tendency or unleashes this politics that studies the other, thinks of it as inferior, and believes that controlling it is their right, right, as a culture, as a civilization. So Orientalist discourse then is not necessarily just of knowledge, right, it also is married to power, right? And we already know that power and knowledge brought together constitute a discourse, 
right, that creates its own objects of study. So he has given us in these pages, right, an account of different ways in which Orientalism functions and then towards the end what it ends up concretizing, what it en ends up facilitating and institutionalizing is a way of looking at the Orient from a privileged position in which those studying it, those talking about it, those researching on it are already seeing it as an absolute other but another which, which is weaker, which needs to be controlled, which needs to be tamed, and which it is okay for those who consider them West to control and to dictate, right? And so the entire project of colonialism and imperialism then, in a way, is underwritten by this discourse called Orientalism. So this is we, where we are in our discussion of Orientalism. Today I've covered some of the pages and read them and discussed them, and we will continue reading the book. It may take us a while to finish it, but I think it's a worthwhile project. Now, I hope this is making sense to you and that you are enjoying reading it with me. Uh, please bear in mind that no amount of lecturing or recording lectures or me telling you things is going to supplement for a careful reading of the text on your part. So do keep in mind that these videos are not meant to be definitive answers to all the questions, but rather kind of a reminder that we all need to constantly keep reading. That's all today. Thank you so much for your time, and I will be back sometime later with the next episode of our reading and discussion of Orientalism. Thank you so much, and as always, peace and love.